So um, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, for the CREA Environmental Studies talk series. Uh, we're very excited to have uh, uh, Professor Ambika Ayadurai join us today. Uh, I will ask my colleague, uh, Professor Anujales to take over, introduce Ambika and get the ball rolling. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Ambika, for uh, giving us this talk. It gives me really great pleasure to introduce uh, today uh, Professor Ambika Yadurai, who teaches at IIT Gandhinagar. And Dr. Uh, Ayadurai is one of those rare scholars who is truly interdisciplinary. She started her intellectual journey as a biologist and only later became uh, an anthropologist. <clears throat> Thus, one of those rare scholars who uh, comes from the hard sciences and is able to talk with us social scientists because she masters both fields really well. She, she is uh, quite known in her own, uh, you know, in her primary disciplinary of biology. She worked on various environments, uh, looked at various non-humans. Uh, she looked at jackals, at birds, at bulls, at dogs. Uh, more recently at the Mithun and the Takin, uh, very strange and uh, little known animals from Arunachal Pradesh. And um, I really had the honor of um, being on her PhD committee and learning an incredible amount uh, from her work on uh, hunting practices of the Mishmi people who live in the Divang Valley of Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, more recently, she has been writing very insightful pieces on the relationship between caste and environmental studies. And today, um, she's going to look at uh, the reasons why there is an absence of caste-based uh, themes in environment studies and also in wildlife conservation. And I think this is really important. Um, over the last few years, in the, you know, with um, Mukul Sharma's work, there has been a growing awareness that uh, a caste really should be an important dimension in, in studies on uh, the environment. So um, she you know, explores why it is so invisible, uh, how to make this a space more democratic. Um, and uh, so today uh, she will give us a, a I think a, a very, very important talk on the relationship uh, between these two aspects. And so I shall stop introducing this pioneering scholar as we are all looking forward to learning more uh, about this topic. Uh, Professor Ayadurai, welcome to our series and thank you again for accepting. And the screen is now yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Anu. Good to see you after many years. After, uh, after my PhD in Singapore. And uh, uh, thank you, Joya, and your team for inviting me and arranging this talk. And I'm also very glad to see my teachers from Wildlife Institute of India, Dr. Ravi Chedam and uh, Dr. Mahesh, and uh, some of my students are here. So, so, uh, I, so there's a paper that I have written. I'm going to read from the paper and I have a PowerPoint, few slides. So I hope I can, I'll, once I start my paper, I'll share the PowerPoint. So uh, what I'm going to present is an extension of a co-authored article that uh, I and Prashant Ingole, my colleague in uh, Wildlife uh, so, so, sorry, in IIT Gandhinagar wrote uh, a few months back and the article was titled Inusability of Caste in Environmental Studies. We received several responses thanking us for highlighting the important topic and many also provided additional references to look into and strengthening this argument. And let me start by stating that I'm not presenting anything new. What I'm going to share is known to most of us. Some of us are teaching environmental studies in universities and some of us are actually engaged in environmental protection projects. But I would like to start by two anecdotes from my own experience of teaching environment, social sciences in general in IIT Gandhinagar. A couple of years back, one of our MA students who was studying society and culture approached me Her research topic broadly touches upon issues of environment and development and particularly on the special economic zones. I felt the issue of caste was important to this study. And, and, when I, and when I suggested that she should look at caste as a factor, she was reluctant to include any aspects of caste in her research. That is one uh, episode. The second was uh, a PhD student in humanities and social sciences. I had a similar concern. 
she was working uh, with a community considered as scheduled caste in one state, but scheduled tribe in another. Her reluctance and avoidance of matters related to caste in studies related to environment and development was intriguing, was intriguing to me. Both were students of social sciences whose research directly examined the issues related to dis displacement, livelihood issues. What was, what was more interesting is that they were keen on perspectives of gender, class, religion, other indicators of social identity. I wonder how is it possible to include religion and gender in the studies, but not caste? One of them directly shared with me that she was uncomfortable including caste in her research. This is not just one incident that I've come across. The reluctance and discomfort among some students and faculty, more so in environmental studies is glaring sometimes. Let me also share one more example and I move on to the paper. In this example, the student was keen on working on the question of caste, but his potential supervisor was not very supportive. With the interference of vice chancellor, I think this is a different, uh, it, uh, not IIT, I don't want to name the university. With the interference of vice chancellor, this PhD student was able to continue with the topic of his choice and completed his PhD on caste and land issues. These anecdotes are not rare, and I believe it's a reflection of how academic spaces function. I have written this paper partly as an autoethnography to include my own experiences, both as a Dalit and also someone who has studied environmental uh, uh, studies, environmental topics. I did zoology in my undergraduation from Saurashtra University and then post-graduation in Wildlife Institute of India. And my subsequent shift to anthropology and now as a teacher offering an elective course on environment in a technology institute. Therefore, I focus on formal environmental studies, formal spaces like academic spaces. And I want to examine to what extent, what extent are the themes of caste and marginality addressed or not addressed. So I'm not going to talk about its complete absence, but I think there is elements of caste here and there, but I want to examine in what forms they are present. So I thank my colleague again, uh, Prashant Tingoli for this title. And when I announced, uh, you know, when the talk was talk of my talk was circulated, I received phone calls from my colleagues and friends regarding the title, the casting environmental studies and alternative approach. One of them suggested I offer a balanced approach and requested me not to talk about caste negatively. He emphasized that there are so many examples where people are peacefully coexisting when it comes to sharing environmental resources. And it's always not about conflict, he said. He also emphasized that there are problems in all societies, no? Every society has some problems, some groups which are discriminated against. Hope your talk will cover caste in various aspects. The casting environmental studies is an attempt to bring discussions on caste-based issues in the formal pedagogy on, on the environment and in the classrooms of our university. What I mean by decasting is, is a process to understand the caste privilege in these studies offered and also casting the margin by bringing it to the center of the academic domain using an anti-caste perspective. Bringing forth visibility and invisibility of caste in environmental studies also means democratizing the academic space to decenter the mainstream. The straightforward argument is that caste-based themes are absent, but I believe it is too simplistic. Caste is one of those categories that is both omnipresent and at the same time invisible. If something is always present, it may not be worthy of any discussion. At times, topic may appear worthy of not discussing because it is too important to be ignored as an uncomfortable truth. This paradox of caste as being both present and absent in its various forms in environmental studies is the focus of my paper. One could argue that this glaring reluctance, presence or absence about the discussion on caste could be seen in all science disciplines, not just environmental studies. Let me emphasize that environmental studies is not just another science subject. The issues of environmental resources such as land, water, forest are directly associated with people's identity and their social position. Therefore, the question of caste becomes even more crucial when one engages with the environmental themes. How much land one has? What is the degree of accessibility to these resources, both in rural India and urban India? It's an indicator of one's social position, status, occupation, region, caste in India. And there is sufficient data to show that, for example, Dalits suffer the most during times of environmental disaster and climate change. Gender, tribals, and forest rights issues find a space 
in interdisciplinary discussions, but not in formal courses taught in our universities is what I'm claiming. And the subject of caste remains silent at large and sometimes in obscure forms. I will actually talk about what forms do they appear in. Discussions about caste and its association are seen clearly in the realms of activism. For example, Gail Lombard's paper, Why Dalits Dislike Environmentalist is an example. We, are, we hear about these associa associations between caste and environment in seminars, conferences, now and then. My concern is when it is taught in the universities as a formal course, in what forms does, it, does that appear, if it appears at all? I will be briefly discuss why caste is important in environmental studies. Mukul Sharma's work is a, is, is a, is a very good example, and it's a, it's, it's a book that, it, that should be taught in uh, university uh, courses. Mukul Sharma has in detail highlighted caste as one of the central categories that frame environmental politics. During environmental crisis, the poor who often tend to be on the lower end of the caste spectrum get disproportionately affected. For example, for example Dalit who are highly dependent on earnings from agricultural labor, labor and livestock rearing, and those who are dependent on forest uh, and other commons have fewer resources to face the environmental disaster. Issues of land ownership among Dalits and other marginalized groups, access to natural resources, even the basic rights to drinking water continue to be an everyday struggle. This must be taught and should become a compulsory reader in both environment and social sciences studies. In addition to that, of course, there is a lot of literature available in the vernacular language, which, which is waiting to be noticed, acknowledged, and included in academic discussion. A study on impact of climate change on the lives and livelihoods of Dalits in India by National Dalit Watch of the National Campaign on Dalit Human Rights in collaboration with the event of, uh, in, the, in the collaboration with the Society for Promotion of Wasteland and Development, this is a page of the report, shows that there is imposition of hierarchies of caste in the event of climate related disasters. Therefore, themes on preservation of resources, protection of species, setting up of national parks and sanctuaries, campaigns for the environment need to be acknowledged, need to acknowledge the role of caste and seriously engage in understanding how Dalits are, are able to cope up with when there is a severe climate related hazards. The inherent socioeconomic vulnerabilities and concerns of caste based environmental challenges must become part of the environmental studies. Therefore, not engaging with the connections between caste and environment seems problematic and unfair. Now, let me show you how the discussions of caste is present and absent in multiple levels. So I'm going to look at three levels here. Let me start with the syllabus that we use in environmental uh, studies. If you look at the syllabus of environmental studies, the social issues are covered to some extent. So this is an exercise that I am continuing to do. I have not finished this exercise. So we looked at syllabus of eight to 10 central universities and government institutions. This is on ongoing work, so I will not be able to provide complete analysis. Topics covered are, are generally environmental pollution, development, population growth, and some themes are oriented towards natural sciences, marine environment, environmental uh, physics, uh, marine environment, uh, environmental physics, environmental chemistry, to name a few. There are courses which teach social, social science perspectives of the environment, which combines themes such as environmentalism, sacred groups, ethics, uh, Gandhian and Tagorean ideas of conservation is taught in uh, Vishwabharati University. And uh, so if you look at the environmental studies course taught in Vishwabharati University, I found that that is more inclusive when it comes to social sciences. But how much of caste based uh, uh, factor is taught is something I have to examine further. These topics cover uh, biodiversity conservation, uh, role of culture in conservation, uh, ethics, etc, which I have uh, listed on the screen. None of them appear to include caste as a category very uh, in, in the, at least by looking at syllabus unless there are discussions on that. And in a uh, in institution in Bangalore, one of their courses includes caste in the environment and sustainable development themes, I was told. Similarly, Delhi University uh, syllabuses has environmental studies that have a strong social science component. So I have to still continue, I have to still examine the uh, syllabus and seeing how much uh, of uh, case studies from marginalized societies are included. Let me move to the uh, let me move to the next topic on how interdisciplinarity is celebrated in environment studies. But in environmental studies, do we really are inclusive when the question of marginal communities are concerned? The field of environmental studies is gaining momentum and expanding its boundary where scholars are realizing how important humanities 
are and how important humanities, uh, how, how humanities could help understand environmental issues that directly impact human lives. While disciplines are opening up to inclusive pedagogy to engage in humanities, what seems to be missing is the issue of caste in environmental discourse because often environmental studies boasts itself as a multidisciplinary subject. Why miss, why, while we may celebrate and embrace the multidisciplinarity approaches, it does not reflect in the teaching or the research to a larger extent, I claim. Not only in environmental studies, I highlight here the allied sciences, such as uh, wildlife sciences, conservation biology, uh, or even environmental humanities, sustainable development, and so on. There has been insufficient attention or sometimes no attention at all to social science perspectives, not to mention caste. For example, the place where I studied, Wildlife Institute of India, where students are trained as biologists, wildlife biologists, social science perspective was absent for a long time. Disciplines such as, uh, 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 fundamentally, there was a, if, if I look at, when I, when I studied, there was hardly any topics that include human issues, people-centric issues, forget about caste, both in theory and practice. But now this is, however, this is changing. This is changing now. Uh, the syllabus has human dimensions in wildlife conservation that is taught in uh, master's courses, where caste seem to appear only in the study area section, or as a composition of the study population, or during stakeholder analysis. But the syllabus needs further examination to make my uh, make my claim more stronger. And the third point is about how we look at the composition of faculty in environmental studies. It is not surprising that there is less representation and sometimes no representation at all from the marginalized communities. This is true for all faculty members put together all disciplines in many universities. So we are actually applying, uh, we are uh, writing uh, RTA applications to find out how many faculty are from marginalized communities. We sought information from 22, uh, we sent application to 22 research and educational institutions under Ministry of Environment and Forest and Climate Change for information on SCST OBC faculty members in environmental studies. So far we have received only six responses. So the number of SCST and OBC candidate appointed to positions in uh, environmental studies is around one or two in these institutions. Again, we have not completed this exercise, but I, I argue that teachers from different economic backgrounds, different training, different disciplinary training could bring in change in how environmental studies in taught, is, is taught in universities. So let me shift my uh, talk to the presence of caste discussions in ecological sciences. So I'm, I'm going to look at two, 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 uh, two papers, which I feel is important because it is written by uh, one by ecologist, second one, I don't know, maybe some of you um, can help me with that. So presence of caste discussions in ecological sciences where matters, of ca matters about caste are discussed, but it appears to provide a scientific justification of the environmental distribution, resources distribution. And sometimes some studies also legitimize the caste system as a form of adaptation, at sometimes or even glorifying it as an example of sustainable development. So I refer to two paper, two papers. One is, the first one is by Gartkill and Malhotra, published way back in 18, uh, 1982. Here the authors show that the linkages between caste and environment as a form of cultural evolution of resource utilization. They borrow frameworks from ecological sciences they say that caste populations are considered as an analog of a biological species and that the resources are assigned as an ecological niche. Their argument goes further that distribution of resources according to caste is like a pattern of resource used to avoid competition for limited resources. Using science or ecological approach or, or using environmental determinism to justify caste system uh, in relation to natural resource management is problematic. Instead of questioning the unequal distribution of resources, Gartkill and Malhotra seem to project the caste system as a way to, by, I'm quoting that from the paper, to ensure sustainable use of natural resources. And also they go on to say, this system must have been contributed significantly to the stability of Indian caste system over several thousand years. And Mukul Sharma has a very uh, a good critique uh, on, on this topic. And I quote from Mukul Sharma's uh, book, a, a, related, uh, a point related to this paper. And he says that they provide a functionalist justification of caste as a system of ecological adaptation 
and one can use some uh, uh, mukul sharma's term as ecocastism if you are using the lens of ecological sciences in support of or justifying caste system and the second paper is uh, titled varna theory of caste system by purnendra uh, kuveri and i'm going to read the full title the varna trophic system an ecological theory of caste formation he begins by a disclaimer not he begins he, the disclaimer comes at the end of the paper and uh, according to the author the paper should not be seen as a defense of the caste system what he demonstrates is a varna trophic system see this image and there are three trophic levels as shown in the triangle shudras as autotrophs engaging engaging in primary production of food heterotroph heterotrophic stratum from those above in the ritual hierarchy and uh, so in the, in the paper if you read there are table of equivalence on one side is ecological terms the other side is the caste terms i'm just going to quickly read that trophic level sub level uh, is equivalent to caste terms varna autotrophs shudras once born heterotrophs twice born grazers slash herbivores vaishas vaisha varna carnivores slash predators raj rajanya varna and then there is a, uh, a term called symbolic man omnivore the brahmana varma and the last one is the detrivore substratus uh, detrivore stratum the equivalent of that uh, according to the author is the panchama are never born so what needs to be pointed out pointed out is that all the population segregated as untouchables as butchers disposers of dead bodies scavengers are termed as polluters there is a section in the paper of titled antibiosis and untouchability where the author states that some species to avoid competition develop certain toxic secretions to ensure other species to stay away from them he says that this specialized population of decomposers parasites scavengers are toxic and therefore must not intermingle and must be segregated kavuri argues that there is an ecological rationale for the adaptive success of untouchability and this he says is the latent principle in the varna system the approach in the approaches used in these two papers reflect a form of environmental determinism that provide rationalization justification of the caste system to show how environmental factors influence the development of society and distribution of resources these authors do not comment on the reasons for this hierarchy of this triangle or even socio political conditions in which these resources may have been distributed in this way therefore the use of science in support of caste system closes doors for any possibility of a change any possibility of challenging the system moreover it gives power to dominant groups to continue the exploitation and to continue legitimizing the system only someone on the upper strata of the caste system can see this as a balanced system but not those who are on the margins or at the lower end of the caste spectrum for whom natural resources are as as sides of oppression are sides called as violent environment environments to to borrow the concept from michael watts the stories of their struggle unequal relationship with the land water of the marginalized should be included to challenge such narratives the coercive nature of caste system when it comes to resource distribution need not to be romanticized or presented in a sanitized ecological rationale without engaging with the struggles of hunters peasants and landless when one teaches about issues of water its accessibility uh, whether it when it comes to water conservation how can one ignore mahat satyagraha similarly in wildlife conservation courses and animal studies one cannot afford to not to engage with the lives of fishermen for uh, hunters pastoralists etc now i'm going to talk about teaching uh, environment with an ambedkar approach with which i am proposing in this talk and i believe this is possible and i believe this is possible both both at the systemic level and at the individual level to bring forth the hidden and much neglected stories of lived experiences of those directly work of the land water and forest and i am arguing that we need to teach environmental studies beyond its technocratic science based management approaches while the systemic changes may take time and i believe that in, at individual level level i would like to share some of my experiences of teaching environment in iit gandhinagar i teach a elective course called politics of the environment and i heavily borrow material from sharma's uh, book uh, caste and nature and i use several case studies uh, in the in the class and my class consists of engineering students students from basic sciences 
master students, uh, masters in arts, and they uh, there are students from in, uh, undergraduate students, postgraduate, and even PhD. In addition to case studies that we discuss in the class, resource persons from marginalized communities are invited to speak and interact with students. This is a picture from my class. In a class on endangered species, because I also teach about conservation efforts by the government and NGOs to save endangered species. In a class on endangered species and what steps are being taken to save the endangered vulture population, I invited a poet and a writer, Gautam Vegda. Gautam teaches in Gujarat Vidyapit and is also currently doing MPhil from Central University Gujarat. And his topic uh, is Dalits and masculinity. But I didn't invite him for that. Uh, Vegda's talk was a reminder that there are communities who have lived with vultures. So I invited him because he wrote a poem, collection of poem on vultures. One cannot just discuss species, for example, vultures and their population and their status without engaging with people's history and lived experiences of sharing food and sharing space with species like vulture. So this is the book here, so, uh, um, uh, it's a small collection of poems by, uh, and I'm going to, this is an excerpt from his lecture delivered in my class. And this is Gautam Rekta saying in the class, this is last year, February, and he also, I invited him this uh, semester also. And tomorrow he's giving another talk about resistance and poetry for, in, in a literature class. So this is what, uh, this is an excerpt from his lecture. He's saying, I have seen vultures in my village. I've seen dead cattle thrown in my colony. I have seen people eating dead cattle. I've seen my family members eating dead cattle. I've seen vultures hovering around, trying to snatch pieces of meat. I had that image of vultures in my mind always. I've come across so many different narratives about vultures when we talk to older uh, people in villages. As my father, my grandfather, they used to talk about vultures, like how they encountered vultures as a competitor. As always, uh, this is how I have ima imagined the entire community as vultures. So for Gautam, these are birds that he and his families have seen on a daily basis. Using imageries and metaphors, Gotham's poems create a picture of vultures that are not found in textbooks, that are not found in papers or literature, unless these literature are deliberately brought out to the public domain. According to Gotham, vultures in his poems are a voice against oppression and oppressive structures of the Indian caste system, not just a species as an object of scientific study. These social and political realities, if told from the margin, will add value to the environmental science and show us new dimensions and questions about social realities. Gautam's vulture is a story of Dalits and for Dalits about their daily struggle to overcome stigma and oppression, exclusion, and for longing for acceptance, and also a quest for dignity and identity. So Gautam's sharing of his lived experiences in, in, in an IIT classroom with largely elite students was well received. Many said they did not know that there are communities who live like this. Inviting resource persons to share their lived experience is more impactful than monotonous lectures from uninteresting textbooks directed towards completion of course, conducting examination and grading answer sheets. Last week after watching documentary, it's a Tamil documentary on manual scavenging, and the title of the uh, documentary is Kakus by Divya Bharti, discussion by students ranged from the possible solutions to the problem to complete denial of manual scavenging that it, uh, complete denying, denial of manual scavenging. One of the students said that they are doing this work by choice. If they want, they can take up any other profession, no? Images of Ambedkar in the documentary also disturbed some students. One student responded that these people think that B.R. Ambedkar will come and rescue them. So they keep their photo photographs everywhere. So this disconnect between the, the, the real world and the, and, and the university spaces is also very, very glaring. Similarly, Field trips are an important part of my uh, courses. Field trips to landfill to talk about waste management was, uh, was very impactful. We visited Pirana landfill in Ahmedabad, seeing the living conditions of people living close to and deriving livelihoods from the city's waste was, a, was disturbing to many students. Students said that they were not able to sleep that night. An engineering student made subsequent trips to Pirana after the field trip to collect water samples to check the pollution level. And during the field trip, uh, environmental activist fighting for justice for the residents of Pirana gave a lecture. So you can see this gentleman who is uh, Mr. Kalim, Kalim Bai Siddiqui, uh, activist, and who has been documenting the living conditions. And he's been very instrumental in making sure the landfills are shifted out from this site. And he also uh, files in a lot of petition 
uh, against the quality of water in Pirana and the uh, uh, health issues. So this is my last, uh, so I'm, uh, I'm going to wrap up now. Caste and its connection to resource distribution as a form of environmental casteism cannot be discussed in class classrooms alone with just text and lectures. There are some possibilities to make classroom more inclusive and diverse in terms of adding more critical reflections from an Ambedkarite position. This perspective will hopefully address the issues of social justice and environmental justice. Again, in, in social environmental studies have to be taught in a, in a holistic way, including social issues. I think if the focus is on environmental justice and social justice, it will be very, very powerful. We may not be able to find solution, but, bringing, uh, but by bringing caste-based discussion, the hidden stories and invisible stories could be brought forward to engage in important issues, which are otherwise not available or not made available to in the academic spaces. Engaging with the caste in environmental studies may appear like a political act, but it could be that this, this kind of acts could help rob issues of justice. There is a need to bring more stories from the marginalized societies to humanize the environmental studies that tend to focus on principles of physical sciences, including humanities and social sciences in casting and decasting environmental issues could address complex contemporary environmental problems. Through this talk, I appeal to academics to be catalyst in creating a systemic change in environmental pedagogy by their critical reflections. Going beyond the model of formal lectures, classroom discussions require material produced by authors, poets, filmmakers, activists, and journal journalists from marginalized communi communities who could contribute to making the pedagogy more impactful than academics, than academics in shaping environmental studies. I will stop here. I would like to take uh, uh, questions and suggestions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambika. This was such a wonderful talk. Uh, really, I, I, you know, I, you, you do such an interesting and important work, and I, I really look forward to reading more of uh, this uh, this study on on caste. Because, as you say, you you cannot work on uh, environmental justice, especially I feel in South Asia, if you don't work on social justice at the same time. It really cannot be delinked, and. Um, what I, what I, so on, a, on an intellectual level, it is very important to make this connection and to talk about subaltern communities and therefore caste, right? Uh, in uh, any work on uh, conservation, on the environment, on animals, non-humans, uh, whatever. The other thing that I uh, really enjoyed, and it has given me uh, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of, um, um, points to, to is your invitation of uh, Dalit activists, Dalit poets, scholars to engage with your students in the classroom. And I think all over the world uh, with Black Lives Matter, really, there has been a greater, um, what to say, you know, reckoning with um, uh, issues of social hierarchy in various societies across the world. And I'm glad to see that uh, caste and uh, hierarchies and what it means in the South Asian world is uh, being, um, you know, seriously engaged with um, by uh, by you and and uh, and the importance really is uh, yes of of taking your students on on site and of having people from uh, various uh, backgrounds coming and talking to them and. Um, I, I really thought that was uh, very, very important. I, I wanted to know how you dealt with students who are uh, reticent mm. uh, with working with caste. How did you go around trying to convince them to uh, start working with caste? So that, that was my, my main question. And otherwise, uh, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. Something that I forgot to mention is that um, you have written an amazing book called Tigers Are Our Brothers, Anthropology of Wildlife Conservation in Northeast India, which was published by Oxford University Press uh, last year, uh, amongst, you know, along with uh, all your very important articles. And um, it's, it's truly a wonderful book, and I would urge everyone here to read it. So, mm -hmm. No, thank you so much, Anu. I think, the, I, think I was expecting that question because uh, I wanted to actually 
uh, go into detail. So these two, I, I uh, that was intriguing. I, th I thought I want to write about it at some point. I'm glad this talk gave me this opportunity to write this down. I think the, I, I was wondering where does a reluctant come, come from? So I'll tell you the responses. So I asked students uh, to send me, think about it, and then uh, tell me why they why they don't want to engage with the issues of caste. And I asked them, go back, think about it, and send me an email. Give it to me in writing. Not to pressurize them, but you know, to, and I said, put it in the thesis. Put it in your master's thesis, why it is. It's a, it's an, uh, make it an intellectual exercise. Through that intellectual exercise, is there some kind of ref, self-reflexity that will happen? So one student had written this email, but not very clear about what, uh, I think sometimes students were coming from a very uh, uh, non-social science background, but they find it very difficult to articulate that. I think I think that's where our job is to sensitize them in the classroom and you know make them comfortable to talk about caste. Sometimes the word Dalit and saying caste is also does it sometimes people are not comfortable even saying the word. Forget about it. I think when we are talking about caste, it's also a self-reflexive exercise. I think it's the both the guilt of privileged communities or if you're underprivileged, the stigma of being underprivileged. Both can play a role in why they're reluctant to engage in caste, uh, caste based. So that student, uh, was a master's student finished, but she didn't engage in, in that. Uh, but uh, another student, PhD student is interesting. She was very reluctant, but then she came back and said she wants to, uh, can I, she asked me, can, can I suggest books? A lot of students ask me to suggest books. They don't know where to start reading. And then I said, cast and nature, Mukul Sharma. And then she read now, I think she, now it looks like she's always knew about caste and caste. Based. So I think some students uh, take it as a uh, important, not as a challenge or anything, but it's also politically right thing to do now. So people want to talk about caste and engage. So, so that can be multiple, uh, multiple uh, uh, issues. And many students I, uh, also approach me who know me and then they want to engage, they ask for a reading list. I give them. I think it's a we have an important role to engage them very uh, not positively, and not to not to not uh, not to say that you know this is you know, this is not their fault sometimes I feel, but if as teachers we can change that. Thanks. Thanks for asking the question. Uh, so the floor is open. I'm sure all of you have questions. Um, Thank you for a fascinating paper. Uh, just. Uh, a question, you think there's been a shift in the last uh, 25, 30 years. Uh, you know, you referred to Gadgil and Malhotra and their study is uh, early 80s. Mm -hmm. And in last 30, 40 years, uh, question of caste has become very central in Indian politics. There's been a very important Dalit political assertion. It goes through ups and downs. I'm not referring to a particular political party. This issue is there in the agendas of different parties. Movements beyond parties, cultural efforts, education efforts. You think in that situation, has there been more of an opening up? I mean, as an autocritic, while you were speaking, I was looking at environmental issues in India, which was done as a reader. And uh, you use the word syllabus. It's a very interesting term. In India, normally they make a committee. And the committee syllabus doesn't mention words like class or caste. It does mention gender. The reader was made after the committee had put together its uh, recommendations. And I'm really stuck in 2007. There is no essay in that. These are pre-published essays, including popular ones, with cast in the title, but it's there in some of the analysis. So has there been a change, say, in the last 15 odd years, mm -hmm. since the early 2000s? Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you so much, Mahesh. I think in the field of conservation, which I'm familiar with, <laughs> in the last 20 years, it's also the international narratives about being inclusive, including gender. Sometimes the funding organizations ask how many women are there in your team? And then there's a book, a tick box. So I think some uh, factors are external and I still feel that, you know, it's external factors uh, because the way conservation is con conducted, one also want to appear as inclusive, whether we are not inclusive or not. So uh, international narratives on uh, indigenous com communities, first uh, people of First Nation, they all have had an impact on Indian uh, conservation scenario. But uh, and in in general, there is a you know uh, because my shift from science to social sciences has been very beneficial for me because in science I was also very reluctant you know hiding the caste and not talking about caste because nobody talks about caste there. So that I uh, uh, so but now in in among my own colleagues in conservation they talk about um, social sciences a lot, talking about indigenous people, but issues of Dalit is still not talk, spoken about in environmental studies in a large way. 
So in the name of indigenous people, we include all marginalized communities. And these terms are also, it's important where these terms are coming from, indigenous population largely from the, the B, from outside India. But in, in, in you, we, so we, we, are, we feel comfortable borrowing some terms where we don't have to specifically talk about Dalits and caste. That is something about caste and Dalits, which still we feel very reluctant. But your question about uh, in the last 15, 20 years of political environment, and especially among the student uh, uh, student spaces, academic university spaces, uh, 2016 and also before that has been. So in, in social science department, you know, institutions which are very active in social sciences, people must have been talking uh, openly. But for me, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm comparing myself with the uh, conservation institution, conservation groups, uh, wildlife, environmental groups. Thank you, uh, Dr. Anvika Ayaturai. It, it, it is a, a revealing and what to say, when I was reading, you showed uh, two papers, right, from um, Gadgil and uh, Kaveri. I, I myself, uh, I have to introduce myself. So I, I, I'm a independent scholar, previously used to associate with Korea University. I worked on uh, 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 environmental uh, and development uh, in that domain. I'm still working and I'm looking for a PhD position. So, so the, in, in that perspective, uh, when I was reading uh, papers, I came across uh, cutting across caste and um, uh, environment, I came across papers like uh, Mukul Sharma. Uh, but before that, I used to read this Dadgil's paper and uh, Kavidi's paper. I used to find it so problematic. And I'm glad that you brought into that, uh, in, in, in this discussion and uh, criticizing it. I, I feel so liberating. And my question would be, uh, so this is a, a kind of a suggestion. I suggest you to do this in your upcoming talks. And my question would be like, in environmental studies, we used to uh, see frameworks or, or conceptual uh, understandings like Duhas, uh, environmentalism of poor and uh, Bhavishkar's uh, bourgeois environmentalism. Uh, in all these uh, things, there is a strong, I feel like uh, a strong emphasis on uh, class factors, but there is, there is a lot of, uh, uh, there is a lack of emphasis on caste factors. Uh, so I can see your work going towards that that direction, but do you think like uh, there is a need for, for, for disciplines like environmental studies to bring in conceptual frameworks that mm. kind of covers caste as a factor, main factor to look through things, mm. or uh, there are existing framework. When I was looking for uh, other uh, lang uh, you know, uh, frameworks to articulate these kind of things, for example, intersectionality is one. Mm -hmm. uh, where we can understand uh, different different factors, uh, social factors. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think like do we need to have a separate uh, framework which which mm -hmm. centralized caste as a mm -hmm. thing to understand environment, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in the Indian scenario, or or the existing frameworks could be able to accommodate such mm -hmm. such factors? Uh, one such example is uh, intersectionality. Mm -hmm. that, that's it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much, very well. I think, see, I think we have to come up with new, uh, the existing frameworks have some limitations. We have to highlight that, but continue to use that also in our, in our uh, not, not discarding any frameworks because all of them are bringing their own perspectives and we have to be very critical of what they're offering. And uh, uh, one of the papers I wrote on vultures is to look at the uh, autobiographies, testimonies of Dalit narratives, uh, Dalit authors. And you read that, I'm sure there is a gold mine there to be explored a lot of wonderful work in terms of poets. So if you look at Mukul, I think for me, Mukul Sharma's work was very, very uh, instrumental in, you know, for, for my own reading. And you know, I'm now going into uh, Tamil autobiographies and Marathi autobiographies looking for translations. And I'm sure there is a, there is something you have to work on that. I don't have any new frameworks. Uh, me and Prashant are actually co-editing a book uh, on uh, human animal relations from the margins. And we have made sure that you know we invite new scholars from the community, from the marginalized community, to tell their stories. And you know, Cambridge University Press has agreed to take this forward. So we are happy. We are glad that you know these hidden voices, which are which are there in written form, sometimes not in written form. So we have to go and collect this information. And uh, I'm sure there is there will be new new frameworks and new literature that is coming out. Even if we are not able to articulate it in an academic framework. But bringing these stories in multiple forms, because we are here, we are talking about students from all across the country. Sometimes our classrooms are so diverse, from students from Northeast, you know, students from you know, Tamil Nadu and Gujarat. And so our way of teaching has also been, has, has to change. 
you know, uh, expecting uh, a teacher with, with, with multiple interest of literature, history is not possible. So we have to reach out to, you know, uh, teachers from outside the classroom uh, and make the classroom more interesting. I think that's why I'm, I'm still focusing on the formal spaces that, you know, if you look at YouTube videos, there will be, you know, protest songs and, you know, there are there is literature. But if you are not able to change the classroom spaces, that is 40 minutes when we go into the class, if we're not able to change that, you know, so I think as, as teachers and researchers, we have to come up with innovative ways of teaching, engaging in the literature, which is not in the mainstream. I don't want to call it mainstream marginal uh, that are in the vernacular medium. We have to bring it that bring bring that and do some analysis. Things will, uh, yeah. We have, I think we have, we have we have a role to play here to bring that to the classrooms and you know change the. I am using the word syllabus again, or, <laughs> or the reading list that we give students. And sometimes uh, I'm the, the big frustration is that students are not reading. Uh, the, you know, so I'm also trying to change the way we are teaching, change the reading list, make it more uh, student friendly and all. Thank you, thank you so much for the question. Hi, Atmika, good to see you. <sighs> yeah, just to um, mention, since you are mentioning about caste and the uh, uh, lack of, you know, uh, in, uh, including caste in the syllabi of uh, universities and uh, basic education. I was just uh, thinking um, along with this, like race, there are um, works which actually uh, include race as a major category. And uh, I mean, it's, it's, there are, I'm not saying that there are a lot of works, but uh, recently there have been uh, works where race has been looked at as an uh, important category while analyzing environmental history, especially happening from Jamaica, all those uh, parts of Caribbean and the black experiences as well in Africa. Uh, so I'm just saying that since the caste experience has a lot to do with racial experiences, I mean, they are similar in many ways. I think uh, that would be a great exercise to probably look at those literature as well while looking at caste. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nisha. I think this is uh, something people have suggested me to, to engage with uh, you know, literature from US or race and all. But I still feel, feel that I don't want to actually, you know, it's important to look at what frameworks are there. But borrowing frameworks and again narrating a uh, lived experience of uh, the lids will be. I think that's something I still feel that there will be a huge, uh, you know, if we do exercise, if we do thorough exercise, because the literature in India is really huge, really huge. And, you know, I think uh, uh, we should engage students and go and document uh, these narratives. And, and then, uh, you know, if you want to framework or theorize, and we can do it. But it's important to include other forms of uh, social movement and, you know, Black movements. Thank you, thank you so much. I think I've so far I've not uh, engaged with uh, uh, my, my, but uh, people have suggested that I should start looking at it. I'll be able to, but that is pending. I have not able to uh, do that, you know, uh, fully uh, engaging with black uh, literature and on uh, environmental racism. So thank you so much, Nisha, for, for your suggestion. Thank you, Dr. Ambika. It was really, really great and uh, great talk. And um, I'm not really well read in this space, but I'm just trying to understand two things. One is, see, there is a uh, there is a constant debate about migration, right? Means people are migrating, and this migration to certain extent create a homelessness, alienation from homeland. So this is a very very big debate in environmental ethics, and um, and uh, to certain extent, uh, uh, so this migration has a has a root to how we can go about village operation, how, can, how, how we can move beyond village operation. And coming to caste uh, dynamic and, and this operation uh, system, what exists in space, like real space, how do you see what is a, what is a way forward? If we, if we take this caste, caste as a lens to understand, our, understand the everyday narrative, understand how, how people have suffered, and then what is a way forward about for you, how do you think how we how we synthesize this migration literature with this with this um, operation literature basically? So if you can comment on it, that would be great. And I, I just want to make another um, another and uh, I just would like to ask one one more comment again. 
So in, in education space, do you think that absence of Dalit, Dalit scholar or is one of the main factor why we are not looking at this issue at all? So this is, these are two my comments. I just like to know your comment and your thought. Thank you so much again. Thank you, thank you, Kalpita. So your first question is, how do we take forward? Uh, you're talking about migration literature. Yeah, a little bit on migration literature and how. Uh, yeah, uh, the answer is, I don't know. But what, what I tell my students is whatever, if it is a social issue, if it, deal, if it deals with poor population, vulnerable population, women, tribals, urban poor, then try to engage with the issue of caste because there is that in a society like India, which is extremely hierarchical, the problems also is going to be hierarchical, no? Depending on how much how much resources we have, so I think uh, engaging with that, I feel is students and scholars will become a little more sensitive to the reality because often one narrative is that the caste there is no caste in India. Uh, IIT is a good example of that. They don't talk about caste and they'll say there is no untouchability, there is no, you know, so I think uh, that narrative is very strong, but I, as teachers in social science classes, environmental classes, if we can bring in caste issues, it is just going to make it more, of course, there will be a lot of students who will be uncomfortable, faculty will be uncomfortable, but uh, no, that is why we are teaching, yeah, that is why we are teachers, no? So include, I don't know how, how it can be included, but using caste as a factor along with other factors is important. And then the, let the scholars decide whether they want to keep caste as an angle or you want to look at from gender perspective. So I don't know the straightforward answer to that. But the second question about absence of Dalit scholars or Dalit teachers. So this is a question that people get, uh, they ask, so what if, if we hire all SST faculty in, uh, in, in environmental studies or universities, will that change? My question is, it's also about the training that we have got. You know, somebody who has gone to science, uh, if, if I have studied only science all my life and then social science was not taught to me, it's also the pedagogical experiences. But I'm, I'm also saying that faculty members who are not from SAST background or marginalized community, they also, you know, it's not about that. You know, it's about being teachers being very sensitive to the issues. But my argument is that we should make all spaces diverse, teachers, students, bringing in students, uh, uh, hiring students from different parts of the country and uh, socio-cultural background is important. One example I would like to give you is we're discussing human-animal conflict in my class about how sometimes human animals, you know, are they, there is encounter and, you know, uh, there are people who, who die because of elephants and other animals because they live next to a national park or next to a wildlife habitat. So one student ra raised his hand and he said, in my village last week, they were uh, gore attacked he was a student from Maharashtra and he lives in a village. And he said two, two people, two people were attacked by gore. Uh, one person is in the ICU, the other person died. So this kind of experience in the class, and there are other students who have, uh, who have grown up in extremely urban, urban and in a privileged background. I think this kind of uh, bringing students in the classroom, making the classroom diverse is important, whether uh, 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 absence of uh, that it's teachers or scholars is, is the only factor. I'm, I'm not saying that, but it should be uh, students, teachers from different backgrounds should be there to make the make the experience and bringing their uh, experiences. But again, I don't want to, this is not a very clear cut uh, thing. There are, there are teachers who have not studied, even if they're from the marginalized communities who have not studied science, the social sciences or in the gender, they can be also at loss. So I think it's the continuous educating ourselves and reading is very important to bring the make, make the class more impactful. Thank you, Kalpita, for the questions. Thank you again for the talk. And I was pleasantly surprised to see the mention of Fake Tree uh, in your syllabus. I happens to be a graduate of Fake Tree, and I can, you know, kind of, you know, vouch that yes, caste was discussed indeed uh, in in our in the coursework that we have gone through. And uh, one of my batchmates actually is working on caste. And in Bombay, uh, she is yet to finish her dissertation. But yeah, um, coming to the question. So uh, as Nisha uh, was asking the question, I, I have a very different version of the same question. Basically, uh, we often equate rest with caste, and we feel that you know we can actually borrow the frameworks that have used for understanding race and environment uh, to understanding caste and environment. So, and I, as a scholar, I feel that. We cannot actually equate because the way the race of op race operate, uh, caste operates with the you know it kind of self legitimizing way it operates and people who are in the lower caste kind of legitimizes their position being in the lower caste which might not be happening to the race. 
so how you see uh, that happening like do you think it is it is uh, appropriate to borrow uh, frameworks from the race and race and uh, environment literature to this task in environmental literature that is one thing and the second question is that with uh, you know over emphasis on sustainability global sustainability you know, to fight climate change uh, what we are seeing that you know the focus on local and regional scale environmental issues be it air pollution water crisis are like kind of shifting right you know, we have now all talking about climate change as being the issue that we all have to fight and this in a way if at all is making that we are part of the same boat and kind of you know, you know over over uh, riding all the differences that people have in that same boat right so how you feel that the, as a as a literacy it's not only just to uh, cast but in general about environmental justice how you feel that you know we can sustain the debate around the sustainability versus justice um, and how the discussion on caste and environment as a way to play it. yeah thank you love to hear with us thank you thank you so much Jeet. i think it's important to acknowledge the framework you know because that is something to engage with because uh, groups marginal groups all over the world are having this they're suffering because of climate change and uh, discrimination environmental uh, uh, crisis and all but again borrowing straightforward from that would be very very problematic i understand the caste will have a they will require a new framework to, to, to look at because uh, it's very different from race. You know, race can be just one category, but with, if we look at castes, there are, again, there are multiple layers within the caste, within the, even the marginalized caste, there are, there could be some who have access to resources, some who are not, don't have access to resources. So I think the intensity and the degree of uh, uh, impact of environment crisis on caste groups and, you know, especially marginalized caste is very different from different from race. So I agree that, but what framework we have, but completely borrowing will be not fair, but acknowledging and learning, you know, borrowing some concepts which are very powerful to communicate to our uh, Indian students is very important. The moment you bring in environmental racism and say, how do you apply it in Indian, students automatically say environmental casteism, even those who have not heard about the term. So I think it's uh, it's important to bring in because these terms, concepts are very important. I teach uh, slow violence and uh, environmentalism, the poor. It's very, the case studies of Bhopal, we discuss Bhopal in detail. And one of the feedback from my course is that, you know, they remember the visit to visit to Pirana landfill and the Bhopal case study because we discussed uh, uh, different frameworks of different kinds of violence. And also in the, in, in the field work, again, I don't, uh, when I teach environment, uh, the field work is the, the morning we go to national park to see the beauty of the environment and we go for the boating in the nalsarovar sea birds and everything and in the afternoon we go to the land the pirana landfill so i want also want to show the complex nature of environment and you know and complicating the terminology of nature so i think it's like you know i tell them that you know and i i show this very nice romantic version of nature and then the real is real, real uh, aspect of you know, the ugly truth of what happens when people like us are producing so much of garbage, where does it go? And you know, it. it uh, and there are students who, you, if you go to the landfill, you have to stand with the handkerchief, you know, close your mouth because it's very, uh, you know, the smell and the and the, and the dust. So some students actually go back to the bus. They'll say, well, uh, and some of them have also so told that, you know, they're not able to sleep because the impact is very, very, very. So, uh, so I, uh, so borrowing framework, one has to be very, very careful. And then it's good to come up with a with a framework that you know, through people's experiences and narratives rather than we theorizing and you know coming up with the fence any framework and the second question i'm not able to uh, fully answer your your uh, fully understand also so your uh, i don't know I, you asked me what i think so i'm not able to respond to that maybe you can email me we can have a discussion on that second question sure. I'll be able to get. thank you so much sure. thank you thank you very Thanks so much. And really, to some extent, your last comment addressed what I wanted to, you know, what I wanted to say and ask, uh, in the sense that uh, the context is really important. I mean, I would, I would contextualize that by saying that to some extent, you know, race and racing is very different, and racialization processes are very different everywhere. What I've seen, and it's really tragic, and I'm glad that you're focusing on the context, is there is a tendency to use terrible words like intersectionality and environmental racism. And why I find them terrible is that, again, they reflect Anglo-Eurocentrism. There's a lot of that work that is drawing on the work from the 1980s and 1990s of transnationalism. So that, that they were drawing attention to the kind of 
things that the UN conference was ignoring. So, so resisting a certain importing of models um, and focusing on the context, I think is, is super, super important. And I'm glad that you're doing that. And I want to have a longer discussion at some point about, again, about comparative racializations, if you will. So thank you. Thank you, Kiran. I think I look forward to having discussion with you. Thank you. Um, Vijay has asked, uh, thank you for your, he's thank you for the talk. And then he said, is something you've highlighted the importance of uh, the convergence of social and environmental justice. Is something already happening in this direction? Do you have a plan of action for making this convergence a reality? Thank you. you. Thank you, Vijay Kumar, for that question. You know, see, the thing is, I have to read up a lot. You know, sometimes I feel I'm not ready to transfer anything into action now. I think my role as a teacher, I really, uh, but I'm, I'm, maybe if there's an opportunity to write something about, you know, help in policy making, I can do that. But right now, I feel, I still feel very un under read, you know, not to engage with issues completely, lack of time and all that. So I think at some point of time, all this uh, research and education, I know classroom teaching should transform into uh, something concrete. Is that if this is if that's what you're asking? Is something already happening in this direction? So I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. But at some point of time, but from my side, right, right now, no. I'm uh, uh, yeah. Is that is that? Uh, oh, it actually um, well, you already are doing a lot of stuff because you are talking to people and there are you're depending on narratives to define what you are. Uh, theorizing this, and uh, I think those narratives matter a lot more than anything else. And I, I, I think you just need to look a little deeper into those narratives, and I'm, I'm sure you will come up with a with a plan of action. I was I'm really impressed with the kind of work that you have already done, and I I I feel it can happen because uh, um, I have been working for 16 years with, uh, with the Dalit community, especially those who are in conservancy and. Uh, you know, clearing red cattle, the Arundhatiyars who are there. And I do know that if, uh, if, if you know, narratives is what finally makes a difference. And I think you and your uh, your co-author uh, are doing the right thing by talking to people and giving those realities, you know, presenting those realities to, uh, to us. So I'm sure down the line, you will have a plan of action. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you very much, Dr. Really, it was wonderful listening to you. Thank you. Thank you. Just a few things that I want to say, like uh, it's it's actually not, I'm not actually asking to adopt a framework here. I was just suggesting that uh, there is a similarity of experiences in all uh, marginal communities and people have all uh, already studied about caste, race, intricacies. There is already a framework there. So I was just uh, uh, mentioning that if possible, similar kind of experience could be race. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Viji, and then there's also a question uh, from Swara in the chat box, which I'll read out to you later. Okay. Also, should we go with Swara first? Because she has okay, had yeah, her exactly, answer. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, yes. Uh, so Swara asks, uh, do you think that there is an absence of a romantic image in the public domain between Dalits and nature, uh, which does not consider Dalits to be people of the earth, like the tribals or elites running campaigns of save tree, et cetera. So is there like a cultural sort of narrative that's missing, which has also led to the illusion of caste in environmental studies? Mm -hmm. No, I, I find I, this is a very interesting question because I also don't want to call people people of the earth. And you know, I think there is something very, you don't want to, what is it called? You don't want to put people on pedestal and then for start worship, worshiping them as people of the earth because it's important to address the struggles there facing. I think it's, it's better to be very practical rather than giving these labels, these titles and award of people, you know, almost like a, like a title, people of the earth, this all looks good. But the practical in, 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 the, in reality, if you talk to Dalits who are actually uh, cleaning the environment or, you know, removing the dead cattle or, you know, doing other, you know, uh, as landless uh, laborers, we'll say we've always been people of, of the earth. So they don't want sort of a uh, in a title or a uh, what is it called? What do you, what do you see for you know giving a recognition in that way? It's not about yeah. giving awards, but acknowledging acknowledging them and you know and then uh, 
so i will avoid going in in that direction let people uh, from the community uh, acknowledge themselves as whatever they want why do we have a, it's not about insider outsider but why is people who are not uh, non dalits or non lower caste give this title to anybody thanks swara i would want to start with uh, thanking gautam for that lovely uh, metaphor i mean lovely imagery of you know vultures as competitors and part of our community i mean it really touches a chord gautam thank you thank you for that and being part of the classroom thank you now ambika uh, you know i came in because i have read your book and it really blew my mind thank you for that tigers are our brothers book brilliant book and uh, you know having sat through this i just have a couple of questions one more an observation race uh, is important uh, but i'm just kind of building on what kalpita said right uh, we do not have too much racial diversity in our class at least to uh, whatever decade i have been teaching but we talk about race but when it comes to caste there is so much of silence and that i just want to say, why is that because you know just bringing race inside and to say can if you have more dalits will we talk i'm kind of thinking but we don't really have too much diversity but we talk about it and therefore how do we engage with our own colleagues to talk about it students i'm still on a pedestal as a teacher and you know there is some bit of power equation to say yes i have seen it and let's take you on a field trip but how do we engage with our colleagues and what were the challenges you faced that's question 1 and then i would go on to the field visit uh, question a uh, little later that's a very interesting uh, important question actually because people feel comfortable talking about race because i think it's an important you know the, the, the race is a very it's a global term right anything anything that is a global term for example people very often talk about lgbt communities people are signing petition gender people are signing petition i think some categories are globally accepted and people feel pride to engage in some uh, you know it's also, it's also the matter of both politically correct and also a matter of pride to you know be allegiance with a group which is talking about so some categories are i i call it this cat where globally it is recognized and you feel that we are part of a global community but when it comes to caste i think it's see i don't know it's whether, whether it's guilt or you know often caste in india is also directly related to reservation so if you have grown up in an environment which is anti reservation and people are talking about why there should be reservation and suddenly you are expecting people to talk about caste and social justice that doesn't go along so i think the silence is at multiple levels so we it, it will be individual specific but largely the reluctance to talk about caste is, is still there uh, in social science it is not that much but it also there are some surprises even social science faculty also will be like reluctant to talk about caste i don't know about uh, i think my presence in iit gandhinagar is very peculiar i am the only dalit professor here a, a, a faculty here and i think uh, there are very interesting uh, at some point i'm going to write about it how sometimes i think uh, people talk very comfortably talk, talk with, with me about caste but with among their own colleagues it is something else so i think there is it, it, it is complex i think i'm um, maybe i'm a dalit so i can be a little more i you know i my antenna is always active so i can see this nuances and many people will come and come and talk to me about so and so was casteist he made this comment or she made that comment and i was like why are you coming and telling me you should you should be telling to that person not to talk about that right so i think sometimes faculty members are also i find them a bit uh, funny and you know sometimes i feel i don't feel uh, i don't feel hurt or anything but i feel that this is how uh, academic elite spaces are actually and uh, and sometimes some faculties are also keen to collaborate with me because of the uh, identity that i have i work on environment which is a, again the environment is a very safe to topic which can you can actually raise issues of caste and you know discrimination and uh, when i when i offered this course uh, when i first time offered this course on politics of the, so i teach politics of the environment and somebody said uh, one of the engineering faculty said in hindi humko malum nahi tha environment mein bhi politics hota hai kya and i said politics sab mein hota hai so i we have a larger role to you know talk to people engage with them i think engaging with them i don't know and then uh, i think not quickly start writing everything about it's not about see that's what i'm not saying that you know we should start organizing conferences theorizing writing books it is day to day engagement with people 
is very important. If people, uh, I'm not, uh, sometimes it's very tiring educating everybody. Edu no, edu educating is not the word to, to explain this way. So once you start organizing uh, discussion groups, I also started a series called Social Justice Series. And we have invited people, uh, you know, I'm forgetting his name, Mohammed, some uh, uh, person who uh, started the Lit Camera Movement Foundation, the Lit Camera Foundation. So we put the posters and, you know, and it circulated. So sometimes people say, oh, Madam, you're organizing this. What is the Dalit uh, Camera Foundation? I said, you come and join. Come and join my class. Come and attend the classes. So I think they, uh, uh, it's important to organize both in the classrooms and also the institution. That we, uh, going back to Dr. Viji's question. But how do we, it's to continue to organize. And there are other colleagues who are now, uh, for example, Gautam Vegra is uh, giving a talk in a literature class tomorrow, March, yeah, tomorrow. So I think uh, the, the, the space will open up. And uh, if, if there are from some faculties who may be very uh, reluctant and uh, not talk about it, that is also okay. I think what, what, we can't do anything about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, the second question, uh, Joya, can I continue? Sure. Yeah. The second question is, uh, you know, also reflecting on my own position in the cast and how do I engage. This also, you know, when you spoke about it, it really uh, comes to me. And then uh, this has been my experience when we take people, uh, students for the field visit, they really come shaken. But when we revisit, how do we deal with people on the other side? If I may say, you know, it almost looks like a tourism education tourism and we leave an impact on people we visited how do we deal with that mm -hmm. no no i have i'm very uh, careful with that and also I, I think this is something which one has to be very careful yeah uh, um, so uh, pirana visit we are not we are not uh, so uh, what i'm trying so this this field work i uh, i'm not taking students to pirana again changing mm -hmm. the field side but that is not the question but Sensitizing students, you know, uh, to 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 uh, engage with people in the community or in you know in and around in the villages. But this is a larger social science question. Yeah. So yeah. Social science research and ethics, and so I also yeah. teach social science research methods, and you know there is a section on ethics and all. So again, sensitizing students, and again, I uh, we should not do that actually to 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 keep people as just uh, you know um, what is it called? You're you're right. I was I was. Also, so agreeing with that, you know, it could become just a tourism for students to go and you know. So uh, in in my classes, so uh, I'll, I'll tell you, in all the field trips, I've been to different. Uh, so the first field trip was to Gir National Park, and in the morning National Park visit, and the evening we, uh, we go around. That's so why I, I work with identify any NGOs who are working with the communities, and, and during one field work, I took them to the Statue of Unity. Second year after that. So again, this is like this very romantic picture of tourism and you know, uh, sense of nationalism, all Desh Bhakti Gana playing there. But in the evening, we went and spoke to the people in Kevadia colony. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. With the activists there, and there was also a student from Azim Premji was doing a MA program. Yeah. So there, actually, they it looked like they were they were very, uh, not used to, but there are many researchers who come there. And when I think as IIT, people want to also engage. I think the expectation is also there, no? as yes. if we have all the solutions and we will be able to do something so that was and then one uh, one field work was in, in gandhinagar same to, we were tracking the uh, i call it the garbage trail the garbage that is produced in the, uh, the individual level where does it go and then uh, we look at the institution garbage uh, mechan uh, uh, disposal mechanism and go to the gandhinagar municipal corporation and there, uh, so I'm making, I don't want to take them to the same places because okay, I think it, 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 it is a not a right thing to do. You know, people will say, you know, and anyway, it's not a right thing, yeah. yeah. Uh, the reason I spoke about it is I can understand the a student holding their nose, but if I'm on the other side, I'm just thinking, how would it, how would I feel about it? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. No, this is something, you know, very difficult actually. So, yeah. and, there and are therefore, some great work. You know, it's not easy. Thank you for doing what you're doing. It's like a lot of lessons for us. Thank you. We really hope to continue talking to you, doing some work with you. Thank yeah. you, Vika. Thank you, Georgia. Thank yeah. you so much. Uh, thank you. I'm going to ask one short question. I know you've been talking for a long time and we have to close out at eight. Um, 
I'm just wondering and going back somewhere to Swara's question also about, you know, uh, do you think that the challenge in uh, sort of talking about Dalit politics and, uh, and environment is because, um, uh, and I'm thinking back on Mukul's talk also, where he read a section out of The Weave of My Life by Urmila Pawan, mm -hmm. uh, because um, uh, sort of uncoit idea, but what I'm trying to say is that, you know, for, the, for Dalit politics, it, that politics meant an emancipation from nature in a way, mm -hmm. uh, right? And that the problematic therefore, so it's easier to equate Adivasi with forest politics. Whereas for, if one looks at Dalit autobiographies, uh, uh, it is the escape from nature, modernize and, and, and a quest for modernity and the promises of modernity. And so to wed a discourse of conservation and wildlife to Dalit politics poses a particular challenge, which is not the problem in mm. Adivasi politics. Mm. So that was sort of one uh, problematic that I uh, that I could see sort of coming through uh, in what you're saying. Um, mm -hmm. So it's changing, but that's because you know one has to. And when he Mukul read the passage from View of My Life, and he read it in a different way, but all I could hear was she's saying that she wants to get out of this trap of nature. Mm. This is a quest. This is a plea for modernity, modernization, mm -hmm. you know? So I guess I'm just, just a reaction to what you were, you know, your, what you've been saying. Yeah, no, no, uh, Jaya, thank you so much. Actually, um, in the class, actually, there is a quote uh, by Daya Pawar in Baluta, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's translated by uh, Jerry Pinto. I'm just going to read it because I have, uh, 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 this is a standard point that I have been, uh, living with vultures, uh, that I'm writing a paper. So Daya Power says that, uh, I'm, I'm just reading, I have never felt any deep appreciation of nature. Nature seemed to be like a rich man with a lot of property. I could only look down on the rich. The issues I had to confront left me no mind space or time to stand and stare at nature. Nature worship seemed to me for those whose stomachs are comfortably filled. So, the, so if you look at uh, the lit narratives, you are very correct, actually, in nature, environmental uh, issues such as land ownership, access, access to water. If you look at water narratives, and you say that these are sites of oppression, by, 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 by I think if I have interviewed uh, Dalit uh, students, so many of them said that you know, they, came to identify, they came to know their identity. There is a story of water somewhere. There's one, one person, uh, one student from uh, Uttar Pradesh, he said one in, in his village, he, uh, he and grandfather were standing outside somebody's house. He was very thirsty. So he went inside and drank the water and came back. And his grandfather was sh shouting at him, saying that, you know, how you shouldn't have gone there to drink water because this is an upper caste house. You should not be drinking. So even in today's day and age, your identity, some the incidents like this related to water, land, these are uh, sites of oppression and discrimination. And if you go and say that, you know, you are children of nature, you are children of the planet, there is a disconnect here. So we, because either you give the land to land and water access to like any of anyone else, we should also have accessibility to water, make that equitable. But, but relationship with water, uh, other environmental resource, nature, natural resources is also a reminder of the daily stigma, humiliation that people have gone through. Many of the autobiographies are about this only. That is what is painful. That is what is painful. The way we talk about today's World Water Day, by the way. We talk, we, we talk about water conservation and you know, and then this element water is also considered as you know, the pure and you know this uh, uh, spiritual understanding of water in religious religious scripts. But for water, uh, even uh, you know uh, firewood firewood collection by Dalits, these are all stories that remind them of this humiliation. Ambedkar has written about this about his childhood memories about how he uh, uh, was not allowed to have water. So I think uh, in one of the Ambedkar Jayanti, I actually presented on water and uh, identity from uh, the, the narratives. I think there is a lot of information about nature. Thanks to Mukul Sharma's work, I think uh, that is published and a lot of information is there to talk about. So you're very correct in the way we romanticize the tribal relationship with nature as, you know, uh, and this, even I have written that in from my Northeast work about uh, this eco-cosmological significance of non-humans mm -hmm. but when the non-humans in the in the in the from the dalit perspectives is something else mm -hmm. it is it is uh, it is related to their 
status, social position, and often very uh, often humiliation. Unless there is ownership. When you don't have ownership, you end up working for someone else uh, in, uh, in the in the land. I don't know. And so, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're all out of time, and uh, it's been a wonderfully inf insightful talk. And you could see from the questions you got. Yes. Um, thank you, and uh, thank you all also for coming and attending uh, this evening's talk. Uh, take care, and uh, good evening. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Thank you for listening and for your comments. Bye bye.